Good afternoon, a very warm welcome to you all. It's a beautiful day here in Dublin, and I hope you're all keeping well and staying safe. My name is Joyce O'Connor, and I chair the digital group here at the IIEA. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar today, which asks the question, digital to drive Irish and European recoveries? A rhetorical question, but I'm delighted that we are joined to discuss this with Casper Plume, who's the Vice President for European Government Affairs at Microsoft. Casper, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we're delighted to see you. Um, and I know you've had a very busy schedule, so we're really pleased to welcome you to the IIEA and we look forward to your presentation. Casper will speak for around 20 minutes and then I will go to you, our audience, for questions. We'll have around 20 min minutes for questions today. Please join in our discussion with Casper using the Q&A function on Zoom, which is at the end of your screen. I'd really appreciate it if you give your name and designation when you ask a question. I really appreciate that and thank you so much. Please also join us on our discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Over the last year, I think I can safely say that we are all preoccupied with COVID-19 and its effects. It is certainly true for European and Irish uh, le leaders. We have however seen how digital and emerging technologies have addressed, helped us address some of the COVID-19 issues. Digital transformation occurred at a pace. Many were surprised how individuals, agencies, systems adapted so quickly. All governments, including Ireland, look to secure e economic recovery now. And the EU is embracing both the green and digital agenda. So it is timely to place technology and emerging technologies at the heart of societal and economic planning. Casper Pla will argue that the remarkable cluster of technology companies and world leading research centers located in Ireland provides a unique opportunity for Ireland to emerge as Europe's digital leader. EU president and European policymakers are seeking to foster a green economy with tech policy. The digital agenda is at the center of the European recovery agenda. Casper will discuss with us how the role of digital solutions uh, technologies can play a core role in economic recovery. He will discuss the question, can Ireland build on a successful export oriented enterprise model with three additional attributes, such as digital policy leadership, innovation, transformation. Can Ireland provide leadership to a digital partnership across the Atlantic with the US? And will Ireland become Ireland's digital leader for 2025? Can we make this ambition a reality and in the process transform Ireland's society and economy on the way? So Casper, as we were saying earlier, this is a very timely presentation and you have the background, expertise, vision and indeed passion to ask these questions. Casper is a Marshall Memorial Fellow Prior to joining Microsoft, he served as Denmark's and the world's first ambassador to the global tech industry. Previous posts include ambassador to Indonesia, Timor-Leste, Papua New Guinea, and ambassador to uh, Cyprus. Casper worked in several posts within the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and also served as head of the European Union's civil crisis management in Kosovo. He is currently Microsoft Vice President for European Government Affairs with responsibility for all of Microsoft's government affairs and public policy work across the EU. He serves also on the senior leadership team of Microsoft's corporate external and legal affairs groups. In 2018, Casper was named among the world's 100 most influential people in the digital environment. You are very welcome again, Casper, and we look forward to your presentation. 
Well, thanks a lot, Joyce, and, and don't believe everything you read, but it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, and, Very uh, impressive, though, Casper, we not, have to not, say. <laughs> not, not at all. I, I pay people to afford those information, so we will, uh, but, but anyway, thanks very much for saying, as we just discussed before before going live, I think the only thing that is, um, is sad about today is that we aren't able to be together in, in Dublin. I have mm. been looking forward to that, and some of my super good colleagues, uh, Katrina and, and Kieran from Microsoft in Ireland, had the, we'd actually postponed this visit so that we could make sure they could happen in, in, in person. But that's where we are, uh, Joyce. But it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Um, I, I think I will, uh, I will talk a little bit to begin with. And whether I'm, I will reach the, the 20 minute mark, I don't know. But then we can have a few more questions, questions. perhaps at, at the end. Um, and, uh, and Joyce, perhaps if I can begin by saying that one of the reasons that we are virtually visiting uh, Ireland is that in many ways, I think we are at a, at a pretty crucial moment in, in Europe's um, history and, and to some extent also in individual member states, including in, in Ireland. Um, and if I was a little bit cheeky, I would say all the questions you asked in the beginning, Joyce, uh, the answer is yes to all of the above. Yes, I think Ireland can play an incredibly important role. Yes, I think the approach to technology that Ireland is, is playing is, is important, uh, not only in Dublin, but also in Brussels. And yes, I think as we look at a world where, let's be honest, we have to rebuild and reconstruct the transatlantic relationship, I think uh, a country like Ireland can play an incredibly important role. But, but just to, to sort of start off where, where, where you uh, teed us off, Joyce, I think you know, when you look at the world here in, in 2021, uh, looking back at a, at a very, very particular year, not an easy year, um, but certainly a year where we've been struggling uh, not only with, uh, with COVID-19 and the immediate uh, impact of the global pandemic, but also in how do we set in motion sort of the preparation for a digital decade, if you like, because I think one of the conclusions that many of us have come to, and I, I count myself in that category uh, also before uh, joining the private sector, before joining Microsoft, it is that digitalization and technology is going to be a major game changer, primarily for good. And it's going to ultimately transcend every part of our society, every single uh, sector, every single industry. And that's one of the reasons why we have to take this uh, not as a, uh, an issue on the outskirts of government or governance, but really as something that is, is mainstream and we need to focus a lot more on. And, and we've been through some very, very difficult uh, months. And unfortunately, we're still not uh, completely through. I'm sitting in, in Brussels, where we just had introduced uh, new lockdowns a few days ago because of, of rising numbers. Um, but it is also evident as we struggle with COVID-19 that had we not had the 21st century technology that we have today, we would probably be facing an even more difficult situation. Um, we have lost thousands of jobs across Europe. Uh, we have people that are struggling. Uh, you know, I have two teenage boys at home. Um, I think they've been doing as well as they could, but it hasn't been easy for, for them <coughs> because of remote uh, schooling and remote education. But the alternative, I think, to having a situation where that is possible would have been much more devastating, mm -hmm. both at the individual uh, level, but also for our economies that would probably have contracted even more. We would have seen an even greater uh, loss of, of jobs. Um, it's also evident that, that these technologies have been instrumental in making sure that we've been able to handle the immediate impact of the pandemic in, in the way that we have, whether it's helping first-line responders at hospitals, whether it is making sure that uh, the scientists and researchers involved in the vaccination programs, they have access to you know, uh, frontline machine learning um, technologies that have helped them uh, move, I think, quicker in, in the development of the vaccines that we're now seeing rolled out. That has been a game changer in, in so many ways. It has also, and, and, and this is where I want to be quite honest, revealed um, a thing that I, I think European decision makers have been struggling with, for, struggling with for many, many years, and that is Europe's role in an increasingly bipolar, uh, digitalized uh, world, where especially the US, but also uh, Asia and increasingly China plays uh, a very, very important role. And I think there has been a feeling both before COVID-19, but certainly um, perhaps gained new momentum during COVID-19 of the fact that Europeans and Europe is incredibly dependent on technology that is not developed and deployed inside the European Union, but comes from the outside. 
And, and that brings me to, I think, one of the topics that, that we really want to talk about today, and that is the, the discussion around uh, digital sovereignty or strategic autonomy, whatever you want to call it. This feeling in Europe of being dependent on, on technologies that come from the outside, and perhaps a feeling of, of lack of control, or perhaps a feeling that we're not building uh, you know, the startups and the entrepreneurs that we want. We're not scaling those uh, companies to, to the level where they become uh, global companies with with a massive impact on the outside, and and I, I think you know there are two ways Joyce, of, of of approaching this discussion. One is to say um, that's how it is, and uh, and we need to to make sure that we uh, we focus on those aspects. Um, I think another way of looking at it is to say that there are really good reasons why you have this discussion unfolding in Europe, and as a global technology company, we have an incredibly big responsibility to try and make sure that we help and assist Europe uh, stay competitive, stay a global uh, power, making sure that we help Europe recover from COVID-19, create the jobs of, of tomorrow. In other words, I think it is very um, appropriate for us to acknowledge that the sovereignty debate or the digital sovereignty debate um, is here for good, valid, legitimate reasons, and we have to make sure that we align ourselves with, uh, with this new reality. And that, in many ways, is part of what we have formulated in, in Microsoft in Europe as a campaign we call uh, Tech Fit for Europe. And of course, that's just a, a clever way of responding to, to the European Commission's uh, Europe Fit for the Digital Age mm -hmm. uh, vision. But it, uh, it is actually more than just a, a fancy slogan. It is, uh, I, I would say, a mindset of how we make sure that the technology we develop, the technology we deploy in Europe, that that is fully aligned with European values, European traditions, and European aspirations. And it's not a small thing because, for example, when you look at, at the discussions around privacy or more recently about cybersecurity, these are issues that I would say are almost existential to, to Europe. And it, it matters a whole lot that we take those discussions with us back home and we focus on what we can do to make sure that there is trust with the technology that we develop and we deploy. I mean, our motto inside Microsoft is that technology runs on trust. And mm -hmm. I think from, for my friends, for my family, it is so easy to dismantle that trust uh, with a few um, difficult um, handlings of, for example, data, et cetera. And I think that's one of the key lessons that we have to take with us that we make sure that we focus on these areas. I think the, the, the other side of, of COVID-19, the other positive, if you like, uh, aspect that has come forward is, of course, the, the dual focus on the dual trans transformation of both going digital and also focusing on sustainability. And I had the pleasure to meet with uh, a number of, of Irish ministers and officials over the last couple of days. And I think it's been really reassuring to see how grounded the discussion around sustainability and climate change is in Ireland as well, despite Ireland being one of the epicenters of uh, foreign direct investments, including by a company. <coughs> so, uh, we have a massive presence in Ireland. Uh, we have data centers, as has some of our competitors. But I think the focus we have both in Ireland and Dublin, but also in, at the European Union level is now that we have to make sure as we digitalize our countries, and again, we have to do that, not because we think it's interesting or nice to, but be because it is absolutely necessary to, to compete in a, in a global digitalized world. But as we do that, we have to ensure we do it in a way which is consistent with fighting climate change and making sure that we do it in a sustainable way. So I think that's one of the few positive things you could say that has been uh, the outcome of, of COVID-19. When you put all of this together, so um, you know, COVID-19, uh, the digitalization of our societies, if you combine that with um, you know, the dependency on, on perhaps a lot of foreign technology, and then you add to the mix something that I think is, is top of mind in, in Dublin, and I'm sure, George, you've spent a lot of time on Brexit. Mm -hmm. um, then, then I think you have, to some extent, the, the perfect storm or the perfect mix, where it is only natural that the European Union, also with the European Commission that has been on office uh, a bit more than a year now, is now beginning to pick up pace and rolling out a fairly impressive or frightening uh, regulatory agenda, depending on where, where you're mm -hmm. sitting. Um, and I think one of the aspects that we've also been discussing with, with Irish decision makers uh, in the last couple of days is, of course, this regulatory wave or regulatory freight train. How do we make sure that that is focused on defending core European values, defending you know, Europe's ability to take its own decision, 
but doing it in a way which is consistent with what Europe has always been about, an open market, free trade, strong on human rights, strong on fundamental rights, but always looking uh, to, uh, to deal with the outside world, always having a strong link uh, towards the, the US. Um, and I, I think that is the only area where we've been perhaps um, a little bit um, cheeky with, with some of the Irish ministers and saying we would love to have a bigger Irish voice, uh, not only in, in Dublin, but also in, in, in Brussels and across Europe, because we are at a moment where defending that approach to, to European history is certainly something that we feel uh, is, is quite important. Um, with Brexit, I think the, the traditional forward-leaning digitalized countries have lost uh, an ally, let's be honest about that, which perhaps has tilted the balance in Europe uh, a little bit in a different direction where there is more focus on making sure that we, we defend the, uh, the, 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 the European uh, approach. And what I think both as a European, but also representing the company that I, that I do, it, it will be incredibly important in the next months, in the next couple of years, that we get those regulations right. They will increase um, accountability and scrutiny, including on a company like Microsoft. We welcome that. And it won't always be easy for us to comply with the new regulations. But whether we talk sustainability or we talk cybersecurity or we talk privacy, we think that is a scrutiny or a requirement that we just have to live up to because that is a core part of making sure that we have trust in, in our new technologies, that we have trust in using the opportunities that the digital age will also bring uh, about it. But it is going to be important that all voices will be heard uh, across uh, Europe in, in this direction. And again, if I if I just turn back to, to the beginning of our conversation and, and uh, what we've spent uh, a few days in Dublin talking to, uh, to the Irish government about, um, I do think that I, Ireland's sort of history and its, its, its experience with attracting investments by focusing on how Ireland can also be sort of a, a beacon of hope in a, in a broader sense, creating the jobs of tomorrow, transitioning uh, society into a digital direction is going to be incredibly important. And I think, George, you sort of asked three, or you pointed to three areas that, that we think are important. So the digital transformation, I think, is where Ireland can pay help be helpful also in making sure that Europe will, will stay its course. I think focusing on making sure that connectivity will, will reach everybody because without connectivity, it is very uh, difficult to be part of the digital economy. Those are areas where we're doing fantastic uh, work together with Ireland uh, on broadband connectivity, interesting things uh, happening right now where more rural area, more um, less connected areas where they're now being hooked up so that you have uh, students in schools that can get connected, uh, broader populations can get connected. Those are examples that we would like to use and scale, not only across Europe, but in fact across the world, because I think this digital divide that we very often mm -hmm. talk about is going to be one of the main challenges for all of us as we look into the next decade. Um, similarly to what we've seen uh, with previous uh, challenges or crises, not being connected today is such an existential issue that I think we have to do our utmost to make sure that we invest in connectivity in Europe, but also outside Europe. And then you mentioned, uh, Joyce, uh, the question of policy. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, you know, being a person who's been dealing with policies for, for a few years in this area, this is, this is one point where I think we just have to acknowledge that the pace of development of these new technologies means that the gap between where policies are today and where technology is, mm -hmm. that that gap hasn't been reduced to some extent, to some extent it has been expanding. So I do think we have to invest both from the public sector, but also the, in the private sector in bringing a new generation of decision makers up to speed with digital policies that we will need uh, tomorrow. And it's one of the reasons why we've teamed up with, with UCD in developing a, a program in, in, uh, in Ireland, in Dublin. And um, I can tell you, I've had several of my own team members attend that course. And I want to give credit to, to my own team member, Kieran, for really driving this uh, prog uh, program forward. And, and I think that's just an example to be used in a lot of other places. I wished I could have taken that course a few years ago. To some extent, I should still take it because I think I could learn uh, quite a lot about how we uh, work together and defining uh, the policies of tomorrow. Joseph, if I, if I just end up with one word that I think is going to be absolutely critical um, in, um, in everything we're going to do, 
uh, that word is going to be uh, multi-stakeholderism because I think this is in many ways where the 21st century or at least 2021 might be different than the world we knew 10 or, or 20 years ago because many of the challenges we face, whether it's on education, skilling, whether it's on sustainability, whether it's on cybersecurity, whether it's on privacy, those are issues that cannot be solved either by the private sector mm. or by the public sector in isolation. We have to work together. Uh, we have to find uh, common solutions. We have to make sure that we all act in a responsible way. And in many ways, I think that's uh, what uh, what we're what we're facing, what we're looking at in the next couple of uh, of years and uh, and decades, perhaps. So I'll finish up with with the first sort of short introduction on this, and be very happy to answer. Uh, any easy questions that you have, the, the difficult ones we can say for, <laughs> for other times. Thank yeah. you so much, Casper. Uh, I think you ended on a very positive note of working together and and, and that complex nature now of, of technology. There's so many stakeholders. But can I bring you back first to the, the, the that first um, comment, the first comments you made about digital sovereignty and the importance of that for Europe and for Ireland, you know, for the whole of the European uh, community in terms of autonomy, but also perhaps that issue of collaboration and working with others, particularly the US, particularly also because of the dominance of China and bringing in your really strong focus on values and trust. Is there a tension there between that digital sovereignty and the idea of developing a stronger EU-US partnership? You will be shocked, Joyce, when I say I don't think there is a contradiction or a tension between, between the two of them, or at least I would say I don't think there should be, uh, because I think it is only natural, again, going back to what I mentioned earlier on, that Europe wants to further develop its uh, its skill sets, its competences, but frankly speaking, also defend its role in the world. Um, and I do think there is sort of a couple of different approaches to technology. One is based on you know the free market, very limited regulation where you can do more or less whatever you want. Perhaps another version of it where there is very heavy involvement of, uh, of the public sector in defining uh, you know, the te technology application uh, up to more. And then I think there is a European way um, and you will probably very often hear from the private sector that regulations are something we don't uh, enjoy. We, we uh, to some extent, I think are perceived as wanting to, to fight back on regulation. And I think that's a misconception because I think if you get regulations right, it clarifies, uh, I would say, how the market <laughs> operates and what is required for us to operate in those markets. And I would just say, you know, going back to one example that I that I often enjoy, I'm Danish, as you can hear from my, my heavy accent. Um, and of course, we, we went through a, a, a sustainability transition in Denmark, uh, dating all the way back to the 1970s. But it's quite interesting, especially in my, my former role representing the government, how often, you know, I heard that it was done out of altruism and just be, be, because you had, you know, Denmark focusing a lot on, on climate change and sustainability, where in fact, the reality is that this was driven by heavy regulation coming out of the government in the 1970s as a direct response to the oil crisis, which basically led to an existential problem for Denmark. You could not cope with the increased oil price, and therefore you had to green the, the economy and make that economy much more sustainable. Fast forward to the late 90s, then you have a new um, you know, sector with a lot of sustainable uh, companies that are doing well on, on the global stage. So I think in many ways, what the European Union is doing right now is increasing the requirements to everybody operating in, in Europe. And I think for us, that is an acknowledgement that digital sovereignty is not something uniquely European. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure, Joyce, if you went to, to New Delhi or if you went to Brasilia or if you went mm -hmm. to and asked, do you want digital sovereignty? I would be very surprised if they would say, uh, no, yeah. no. Not yes. particularly interested. <clears throat> I think I think where, where the world is looking towards Europe is to define what digital sovereignty means in 2021. Mm. And I don't want this to, to sort of turn into a too historical uh, discussion, but in many ways, I would argue that the European Union has always been a response to a particular set of challenges around sovereignty. You know, the European Union mm. is in many ways a response to the Second World War. And as we've seen Europe integrate, evolve over the last uh, couple of, of decades, 
that has been about you know finding a way of increase of, of maintaining the sovereignty while at the same time expanding sort of the sovereignty notion as we know it and in many, way, many ways i think this is where europe has a unique opportunity to also get the digital sovereignty right of course in my view that should happen together with uh, with the united states mm. uh, because i do think we share a similar approach to uh, to the way we look at societies and ultimately this is about also defending i would argue uh, our democracies and the societies we build over the last uh, decades. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting. <clears throat> we had uh, Roberto Viola here there in early in January talking about digital sovereignty too. And, you know, there, is, there isn't a common view of what that is, but he, he kind of summed it up. In a way, I think you might be happy with it about empowerment and resilience that it gives you the empowerment to do things and the resilience to go with your values, your, your trust and so on. So I think maybe there is a change coming in that tension between regulation and innovation and making technology such a central part of, of who Europe is and what we're doing. There, there's an interesting question here, if I can go to uh, from Paul Duber, from the Department of Finance, uh, retired, he says, uh, does Casper agree that even if supplied by commercial interest, broadband is now a public good and should be regulated again accordingly and universally provided? What are the obstacles here? Yeah, um, first of all, I'm happy that, uh, that Roberto uh, said something along those lines. And, and just a final remark yes, on the yeah. discussion. I think Commissioner Vestager, uh, who is, of course, uh, the executive vice president of the European Commission, have, have said publicly that in her view, digital sovereignty is very much about regulatory sovereignty. In other words, mm -hmm. the ability of the European Union to set its own rules independent of other interests. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's the control dimension of, uh, yeah. of the sovereignty notion. And again, you know, I'm a European. I, I get that. I think it's, it's necessary. I think it's fair. And I think for us in the industry, that is the starting point. Also, when we engage, hopefully constructively in discussing how do you get, you know, the Digital Markets Act or the Data mm. Governance Act or the Digital Services Act, Act, right? Mm. You do that with a starting point where you say, we get why you're doing this. There is an issue with, with gatekeepers. There is an issue with, with safety online. And, uh, and sometimes that requires us to do things that are difficult or complex or expensive. But... But if it's doing the right thing, then I think that's the kind of partnership we would like with uh, with Europe across uh, across the board. Th then coming back to to the question from uh, the retired gentleman, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure he isn't too retired, Casper, but that's what he describes himself as. <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. And <clears throat> it, it's it's interesting this discussion about public uh, goods because it it actually goes back to um, to uh, the high level panel on digital cooperation that the United Nations. Secretary General established uh, a couple of years ago, and it was one of the conclusions coming out of the report saying there are certain public goods that, that we can compare with other public goods, and, and in broadband connectivity was certainly among, among those. So, so I think the, the short answer, and I'm sure there is a complexities around this, is that you know, investing in, in connectivity and broadband is going to be uh, you know, one of the key challenges uh, of our time. And I, I sit on the board of, um, of a small uh, company uh, called Blue Town. And, uh, and what they do is to try and connect the unconnected. Um, and they're focusing on mm -hmm. developing economies. They're very heavily engaged in, in Ghana and Africa, where they're trying to establish basically sort of expanded Wi-Fi hotspots in, in, in rural villages, which means that the schools can get online. You can sort of serve the broader community also with access to basic healthcare, et cetera. And, and again, I think it just shows that I think all of us have a, have a responsibility in making sure that we make those investments and that we also make it in a way where we get the last three and a half billion people uh, online. Mm. Um, if you want a more <clears throat> cynical version of it, Joyce, uh, sitting here in, in, in Europe, I think the migration crisis that we saw a couple of years ago, um, in many ways that was driven by perhaps you know, poverty or escaping from, from conflicts, et cetera. I think we have to recognize that not having access to, to broadband today is what sets you apart. Will you have the possibility to have a job uh, in the future or not? 
in to some extent in many areas in many sectors that will depend on your your connectivity. Mm. So I think the short answer is uh, we have to make sure that we increasingly treat um, connectivity as a, as a public good, um, and whether we regulate it in such a way is is perhaps uh, uh, you know you require a bit more insights than than I do. But I think the overall approach is clear. Yes, and I suppose you've shown by example Microsoft has as you said, worked with people. I know in Ireland here, there are a number of initiatives you've taken around broadband. And it is one that everybody agrees should happen. So it's actually working together again, isn't it, with the public and private sector to ensure that can happen in a way that's positive and inclusive to all, all people in, in society. It's absolutely critical. Um, I have a question here from um, Ashling Kelly from the office of the uh, DPP. Um, can you current regulatory response from various EU member states to online state safety, the example in Germany and France, and whether Microsoft would prefer a pan-European response, which re would require a change in law rather than a more fragmented approach? I think she almost gave the answer herself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a very big uh, believer in, in the European Union and um, and therefore I'm, I'm, I'm probably also more on the side that I think uh, Europe wide regulation in general is not a bad thing. And I think it makes ease, it, it raises sort of the uh, the basic level. Um, I think we've seen the same on the environmental policies. We've seen the same on sustainability policies. So. I think our general response would be we will comply with all national regulations um, completely, whether they're national, whether at the European level. But of course, for us to work together with, with the European institutions and have this kind of multi-stakeholder dialogue where we try and provide our insights, uh, you know, we, we make available what we think is going to come in terms of new uh, technology developments where we have challenges and, and, and you know, um, complexities inside. I think that is, of course, uh, where where the European Union provides some uh, some opportunities yes. also for a company the size of Microsoft. Thanks for that, Casper. There's another question from Adrian Weckler, who's from the Irish Independent. What specific issues should Ireland be louder on at a European level? What are the barriers, uh, the biggest barriers to European tech? Big question. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I think it would be, um, you know, very inappropriate for me to refer to the conversations we've had with ministers over the last couple of days, but I'll, I'll give it a shot, at least trying to be a bit generic. And then uh, Katrina and, and Kiran from uh, from our office in, in Ireland can, can kick me virtually under the table uh, in the next couple of minutes. I, I, I do think that this um, change of, of the balance of power in Europe, if you like, with due to Brexit, um, it has had an impact. And, and again, um, I, I think when you look at, at the countries that we normally call the digital nine plus countries, so the most digitalized uh, countries in the European Union, traditionally the most, fo most forward leaning tradition, the ones that have been arguing for, you know, light regulation rather than heavy regulation. I think those countries have become uh, a little bit more vocal, a little less vocal, sorry, in um, in, in Europe over the last uh, perhaps 12 months uh, to 24 months. And, and, and again, speaking both as a European, but of course also in the job that I have, um, I think we want to make sure that those discussions taking into account various views across Europe, that those discussions are at the core of what is happening in Brussels, including when you're discussing uh, the regulatory framework coming forward. But I also wanted to mention one specific uh, initiative, and that is the Gaia X initiative, which is mm -hmm. about creating a, a federated cloud in, in Europe. So it's very much about interoperability, making sure that customers can choose between different providers. And yes, we are, of course, one of the, the main providers uh, of cloud uh, technology in, in Europe. I think that's a discussion where, you know, what originated in Germany then became sort of a Franco-German initiative. Now it's reaching uh, the European Union level, mm. um, getting that project right. And we've been a supporter from day one. We've been a member of, of GAIX from day one. But of course, it, in our view, that requires uh, a lot of different voices and a lot of different experiences. And I, I do want to, again, point out to, I think, a fairly unique uh, situation that Ireland is in because of the massive presence of technology companies, because of the focus mm. on the government, 
on, uh, on, on digitalization. And then lastly, also because of the strong transatlantic ties, I think Ireland has uh, the opportunity to play uh, a, a really critical role in, in getting this right to the benefit of Ireland. Uh, I think that's important to say as well, but also to the benefit of the European Union and yeah. you know, all of us, including myself, that I would consider a citizen in Europe. And in a, in a way, and thank you for that, Casper, uh, this GAIAX project, does that demonstrate how Europe can pursue digital sovereignty at the same time as digital openness? Do you think that is a good example of that dual approach of being open and yet looking at the autonomy and sovereignty and empowerment of, of member states? Yeah, yeah, well, I think that should certainly be the aspiration. I mean, again, I think the idea here is to create a, a, a market uh, also for, for cloud technology. And again, I just want to, why do, you, why do you want that? Well, it's because the cloud offers um, unprecedented opportunities. And by the way, if I may just add this, Joyce, I think there is a, a misconception that the cloud has bigger benefits for bigger enterprises, when in fact we know that small and medium-sized enterprises are the ones that benefits the most from going to the cloud because mm. of efficiency opportunities, but also because of access to technologies, uh, almost regardless of what, uh, what area they do in. And by the way, then you get better cybersecurity and it's also a more sustainable solution than it is to have uh, on-premise uh, servers in, in, your, in your basement. Um, but I do think that you know, moving forward with an ambitious plan of going to the cloud is very much also what the GAIX project is about. And mm -hmm. needless to say, that's something we're embracing wholeheartedly. And if you combine that with the Data Governance Act, which is another piece of regulation mm -hmm. coming forward, which is very much focused on, on the opportunities around data. And I think what is, what is fantastic about those two projects in combination is that it really focuses, focuses on the opportunity of data not only the challenges and where we have to be very, very cautious, and there are areas where we have to be cautious because of the sensitivities of the data sets, but it is also about acknowledging that the data-driven economy holds enormous potential, not least in a mm -hmm. European context where we have, I think, um, you know, worldwide unique data sets, historic data sets that are mm -hmm. second to none on, on the global stage. So I think, you know, GAIX, the Data Governance Act, um, what we're seeing in, in many of the regulations coming out forward is very much also a push of saying we have to move in this direction. We have to take full benefit of what what the what the digital economy will bring up, bring about. And for all companies uh, and I would say all governments, having a digitalization strategy is going to be absolutely critical for us in the next couple of years. So mm -hmm. I think we get the GAIX project right. I do think it's That's an operational operational way of looking at, at digital sovereignty. We just want to make sure that that sovereignty will still make it possible for companies, including Microsoft, to uh, participate and contribute to the economy of, of Europe by providing responsible technology that lives up to the highest standards. Thank you, Casper. And I have a question here from Seamus Allen from the IIEA. Um, you discussed earlier the importance of trustworthy technology. In fact, it was a theme all the way through your presentation. And the EU is due to release its proposals for trustworthy AI in April. What are your thoughts on establishing trustworthy AI and the EU's thinking on the issue so far? Yeah, we, I think we know a little bit about what's coming because the, the EU launched a white paper uh, a year ago that sort of gave the indications of where the European Union might uh, move on this one. And you know, it's interesting, including for a company like Microsoft, because of course we believe that AI holds um, again, unprecedented uh, potential, unprecedented opportunities in identifying patterns and helping us, um, you know, solve some of the global issues. By the way, including on sustainability, where we believe that AI is going to be one of the main game changers in, uh, in in looking ahead in the next couple of decades. But there are also areas where we have to be careful and cautious, and those are areas where it could have a huge impact on your fundamental rights, or it could, it could create biases in decision making. And I think we've been among the first companies to say that facial recognition, a technology mm. based on AI is a good example of technology that we really need to make sure that we have the proper regulations uh, around to make sure that it cannot be misused by, by anybody. And so what we like about what we think will be in, in, in the draft regulation is a distinction between uh, what I would say, what I would call sort of high risk applications of, of AI and non high risk applications of AI. 
So in other words, Joyce, if uh, you're probably a better person than I am, but yeah. if you theoretically tonight would go home and, and would like to watch a Netflix uh, movie, you know, there will be AI providing uh, some suggestions mm. for you. And um, and I will probably call uh, those suggestions, uh, um, you know, not exactly high risk uh, application of AI, mm. but there might be other examples where mm. application of AI could have a fairly dramatic impact on uh, on you as a citizen and your fundamental rights. And those are the areas where we have to double down and make sure that we have a very, very clear set of guardrails in defending, um, you mm. know, the fundamental rights. So, so I think that's what we're hoping to uh, to have come out of, um, of, of, the, uh, of the proposal. But at the same time, also making sure that um, AI is not seen as as, a, as an enemy or risk, but rather as an enormous opportunity, not least in a place like Europe. Well, Caspar, unfortunately, we could keep you here for much longer, but time has caught up with us. So thank you very much for your presentation. I think you, you made a number of really key points, one of which I think we've heard loud and clear about the voice of Ireland. Uh, and, and thank you for that confidence that you feel that we can have that voice and the importance of strategy to en ensure that that will happen. Also, the emphasis on trust and values and, and, and appropriate rules to help us negotiate through the very, uh, I suppose, challenging uh, areas of technology that we don't fully understand as yet, but are going to make such a difference to our lives. But you clearly showed on three areas, at least uh, sustainability, cybersecurity, David privacy, what can be done both in a sustainable way, but also for tech policy. We would have loved to talk to you about other areas like skills, because I know you're very, very interested in that. But thank you very much again. And I, I'm sure we will invite you back. Hopefully it, things will be better and we can invite you in person to Dublin. So thank you very much again, Casper. That was really very important to us and an excellent presentation. Thanks very much, Joe. It's my pleasure. Thanks. Bye now. Thank you.